Are we good to go? Great. Um, welcome, welcome to everyone who is watching on the interwebs today. I am Lucy Gelman, editor of the Arts Paper, um, and I work for the Arts Council of Greater New Haven. And I am extremely excited to be having this, to be moderating this discussion today on what is queer art. We only have an hour, so I don't know if we're going to get to the answer or if there is a definitive answer to that question. But let me tell you who I have with me. I'm really, really excited to have this panel of rock stars from New Haven. Um, first, I'll be introducing Patrick Dunn. Hello. <laughs> Patrick is the executive director of the New Haven Pride Center and a great fan of art, but also a practitioner of art. You may know Patrick uh, in many contexts, including uh, as his drag alter ego, Kiki Lush Lucia? Lucia, Lucia, I always say it wrong. Lucia. <laughs> um, I'm also very excited to have Joey Reyes with us. Hello. Joey is an executive assistant and line producer with Long Wharf Theater, and we are extremely lucky to have them with us. They recently produced Trans Black Women at the Center, so if you were lucky enough to see that performance, um, Joey is the magic behind the scenes. And we also have Finn Lockwood. Finn, welcome. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Finn is a multimedia artist in New Haven. You may have seen them last year in uh, an exhibition at the New Haven Pride Center or in Trans Body, which was a two-day, two-night experience at the Ely Center of Contemporary Art. Or maybe it was one night and it was so good that I thought it was two nights. <laughs> <laughs> it was one night only. <laughs> okay. um, welcome. In my, in my brain, which has been um, sort of turned into Swiss cheese by COVID-19, it was two nights. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So, so let's get right into this. I was struck actually by another queer artist who spoke earlier this week um, Sulinet Morales, whose work is behind Patrick Dunn. And one of the things that Sulinet said that stayed with me was this expectation when she was commissioned to make art for things like pride festivals, that it would have rainbows, that it would have same-sex couples kissing or making love. Um, is that queer art? Like, let's, let's get right into it and let's get down and dirty with this. Are we popcorning, Lucy? What do you uh, want to do? So let's, um, Patrick, let's start with you because you have Sulinet's art um, behind you. And I would say no one should feel obligated to answer every question, but I feel like there is going to be so much rich, richness in this discussion that we may not get beyond the first question. <laughs> um, so I don't, I, I, I will say, I don't know the answer. Um, I, I struggle with that question as a curator of a LGBTQ only gallery space um, that aims to only elevate the works of queer artists. Um, you know, it's, it's a question I struggle with a lot of like, does it actually have to have like gender identity or sexual orientation or um, anything else that falls under queer um, to be recognizably queer or is just being the artist being queer, is that enough? Um, and, and I will admit, I don't really know the answer. Um, I guess what I have done within the center walls and within our gallery is um, when we, we have an artist come in, we have their work reflective of the queer experience and telling queer stories. So that's how I define queer art within the walls of the center is, you know, is it, is it telling a queer person's story, whatever that story is, and is it, is it you know, operating within that kind of area? Yeah. Uh, Finn and Joey, I see both of you nodding. So whoever wants to jump in, I don't believe in hand raising or anything like that. <laughs> sure. Um, I'll, oh. Go ahead, Joey. <laughs> uh, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I think in the same likeness that there is no one way to be queer. Uh, queer identity is very much a thumbprint for every person who identifies in that way. I think you know, if if you are a queer person who produces art, creates, um, it, there's there's a plethora of of definitions for that. I think, I think for me, I would define it as as anything that is expressing the fluidity of gender and sexuality. Um, 
I, for me personally, like that, that's the art that like really speaks deeper into my soul as someone who identifies as non-binary, anything that's playing with gender, playing with sexuality. And it's like sitting outside of the norm of, you know, cis hetero normativity. Yeah. Finn, what about you? Um, well, I like how Joey said that, like, you know, use the word personally, because I think that the definition of queer art is very personal. So, um, you know, I was having a really hard time answering, like at first, like when Patrick reached out to me, I was like, oh my God, yeah, I have so much to say about this. Like, this is gonna be so easy, but I was literally stopped at like the beginning because, you know, my concern is that as soon as we start defining what queer mm -hmm. art is too rigidly, like that, does that create stereotypes? Like, does that create gatekeeping? Does that create like, you know, um, do I have time to tell like a quick story just to kind of paint what I'm saying? All right. A hundred percent, yes. So I feel like we have this tendency to like, as a society to just want to like demand what queerness looks like in like, mm -hmm. you know, fashion, appearance, art, you know, music, et cetera. Um, you know, and that was kind of brought to me um, at work, I've, I'm sort of like half out at work and some people have found out through social media that I'm non-binary and I had a conversation with one of my coworkers who, you know, is like means well and like has the best intentions, but just kind of, it needs some, you know, education. So she said something to me to the effect of how I fit her you know, perception of what a non-binary person looks like, which is like a butch lesbian. <laughs> and so like, you know, like there's already this face to queerness, which, you know, you know, we have a face of what not a non-binary person looks like, a, a gay man looks like, a, a butch lesbian. And like, you know, they're all white too. I feel like, you know, so much of this is tied up in that current conversation too. Um, but yeah, so it's 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 a it's a loaded question. I, I think it's like a good question to ask, like how how do we recognize queer art but like not define it too heavily? Because I think queer art is like if I could give it any definition, I think queer art is like not giving a crap and like being free and just like letting go. So yeah. Well, I feel like this was not one of uh, the questions I had going in, but that's the beautiful thing about panels. They change, uh, the questions are porous. <laughs> and Finn, what I hear when you're talking is that you are also talking about the fact that because of capitalism and patterns of consumption in this country, there is the expectation often filtered, almost always filtered through a white lens, a white consumerist lens. Um, there is the expectation that things will live sort of in like widely consumable boxes. And so maybe this should be a question for later, but I'm just gonna throw it out right, right now. How do we, especially during COVID-19 when unemployment is up, um, when the landscape for the arts looks very scary, how are we liberating queer art from a system of capitalism in this country? Hmm. I nominate jo Joey to go first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> as I'm gathering my thoughts, I'm thinking about, um, I think what makes queer art so unique to, in speaking to those mainstream ideologies that it doesn't fit within those, right? Um, I think, and I, and I, and I, you know, as much as there are some mainstream, uh, there is mainstream queer artistry that is existing in the world with things like RuPaul's Drag Race and Pose and like these amazing giant platforms that are um, uh, showcasing queerness uh, and, and gender diversity um, on a larger scale. It's still, you know, it's also showcasing the way that that these things like capitalism and racism and classism and ableism are affecting the lives of queer people. Yeah. And um, I'm glad that we're also moving into a place where something like Pose is, is sh shedding a light on something that has obviously existed for such a long time, but people just like are not privy to or like don't know the historical context of. Um, and, I, and I think 
to a, a, a way to to liberate this art is to allow it to is, is to not be gatekeeping right and I, we've seen the effects of that like um i'm going to throw out the reference of documentary the queen Mm -hmm. um and its correlation to paris is burning which are both on netflix and i highly recommend people watch um in the queen you know we're seeing drag pageants that were that were being produced in the 1960s and how whitewashed they were um and you know towards the end of the documentary you see you see um a black trans woman crystal labeja um kind of like fighting against this very biased um, system of queer artistry. You know, it's supposed to be supposedly supposed to be a space that's meant for them all to be there and and express their their identities and 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 their artistry. And she was still being you know siloed and and, and pushed to the side, and which led her to then create the House of La Beja, and then we're you know brought into the world of Paris is Burning and and the voguing ballroom scene of the 1970s and 80s that was birthed out of that, um, which then like was allowing queer and trans people of color to li like liberate themselves in their artistry um, and yet still be underground and then eventually come into mainstream once Madonna got a hold of it, right? Um, so th there's always gonna be a way to like capitalize on it, but I think, I think people are gonna have a hard time or, or people, people, people will find a way to capitalize on it. Um, but I think it's really important that we're like recognizing where it comes from and the and the history and that it's it's you can try to whitewash it for it to be mainstream, but like the truth of it is rooted in like something that is never going to fit inside of a box. Yeah, um, I, I'm going to add to uh, Joey's list. So after you watch The Queen and Paris is Burning, then you watch uh, When Paris Burned, Hartford Sizzled, which mm -hmm. is a documentary about the Connecticut ballroom scene in the 90s. Um, <laughs> but, um, no, I mean, I, I'm going to, you know, kind of jump off of what Joey was saying. You know, I think it's part of how we do this is taking the responsibility as a community and say, like, we're not going to allow this consumerism. Like, like something that's been happening, um, you know, in the drag scene, for example, is this idea of like women can't do or cisgendered women can't do drag or trans people can't do drag or this person can't do drag. And it's like, that's not what drag is. Drag has always been inclusive of every single kind of person and every kind of identity and every color of skin. And, um, you know, the idea that certain people can't do drag is coming directly from the top of the consumer thing, which is RuPaul, which you know, was a gender non-conforming, uh, radical queer black artist from the nineties who became commercialized because that's what happens. Um, and, you know, RuPaul from the nineties is very different from RuPaul from 2020 um, that's saying cis women can't do drag, trans people can't do drag and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's us as a responsibility to be like, no, that's, that's not the case. You know, like, again, just looking at Connecticut, the Connecticut drag scene has always been inclusive of trans people. Um, it's like, I, I, you know, as someone who's been around in the drag scene for like 15 plus years, like it's, there's always been trans performers. There's always been um, cisgendered women. These people have always been around and they were always accepted. And as RuPaul started kind of sending out this message is that these types of people can't do drag, like there was this weird thing going on that like people were being excluded from shows and certain producers weren't booking certain performers. And then the like, new generation was like, no, everybody can do drag. This is our art, you know, fuck y'all. Um, and, <laughs> and it was interesting to see like the younger generation that didn't know the history that it had always been inclusive. Um, and think it's like so radical that we're like pushing against RuPaul. But, you know, I think it's the, the way we keep it from being too commercialized or too whitewashed is really as a community making a decision, we're not gonna accept that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, Finn, I, I wanna make sure that I get your perspective and then, um, well, yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I, I think accountability, it, like you were saying, Patrick, like that is, and I do see that a lot in the queer artist community. Um, you know, uh, I think like, I wish, and I feel like it would be best if we just got away from like trying to like 
make our our work just solely a product you know like i just wish we could walk away from consumerism but like i do think like i think about the queer tattooing community a lot which is like kind of like you know it's a subculture like uh, on instagram um where it's just like you know queer people tattooing and many of these people didn't you know learn through tattoo shops they learned on their own and you know, they're very much kind of trying to dismantle the hierarchy of like, you know, of course, this white men being at the top of the tattoo industry and just kind of trying to break it down. Um, so like, I don't know, I feel like I'm just kind of like, radical in my beliefs and stuff where I'm just like, I hate capitalism, like this stuff needs to end. But like, I do like that I think that queer art is also about kind of like working the system and like, you know, knowing that we're living in a capitalist society, but finding ways to like be a little, I don't know, I don't want to say sneaky, but like clever about it. You know, like there are some queer tattoo artists that have, like I said, never apprenticed under anybody. And I'm not saying like don't apprentice under a tattoo artist because you should, but I'm saying a lot of people have learned like just through the, sheer desire to do it and like now have like a solid full-time career just off of doing that and i think that like is kind of like working the system in a way but yeah yeah, yeah i i mean i i think that's true um so i'm going to work backwards selena asked um and thank you for your question asked about um sort of representation and greater uh accountability for equity and i want to walk that back to education and ask all of you, um, you know, the context or context in which you were taught this nebulous thing that we call art, <laughs> um, right? But also whether any of you experienced um, queer representation and, and also um, folks in the movement who were not white. Because I will say it should not have, have taken for me to get to college to learn about who Marsha P. Johnson was, right? Um, and I think a lot of people um, had that experience. And and it's not it's not okay going forward. Um, so so for all of you, you know what what did education arts education or arts in education look like? Um, was there anything that you were told maybe arts was or wasn't? Um, because people can have very rigid rigid definitions of it. Um, and and also, did you you know did you see queer folks in art? Did you see queer folks making art? Was that part of the discussion for you? Um, let's start with Finn. Um, I feel like there were so many questions there. <laughs> I'm really mad at just, that. No, no, it's totally fine. I, I, I just, I had so many thoughts also at the same time, but I, I pinpointed, um, thinking about like queer representation in terms of like my art teachers, like anybody who has taught me art. Yeah. Uh, and thinking about it, uh, well, I mean, I can think like of in really integral people that have come into my life later that like, you know, I kind of found once I moved to New Haven and like, you know, met a community there. But prior to that, like the first um, gay educator I had was when I went to FIT Fashion Institute in uh, New York City. And I was very surprised. I don't know, like I haven't kept up with FIT at all. I was only there for a semester because like I, I couldn't afford it. I'm still like deferring that one semester. <laughs> <laughs> but anywho, um, I thought for sure that there was going to be more diversity in like the, the teachers. But from my recollection, most of my teachers were white and I only had one teacher that was like openly gay. And um, he was... A, a, an older gay man and he had really just like hateful toxic views about women mm. and mm. It, it 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 feels like that the fashion industry just kind of creates that that whole thing so like i feel like i didn't get like a positive representation or even like an understanding of queer art until like i moved to new haven and like you know, I think local artists like really just kind of gave me the most representation. Um, I think that like the education I've gotten in like the real world has served me 
much better than like any formal education. And that's just my experience. I know a lot of people have good experiences with formal education, but like as a queer person, like I've never felt supported until I got into a tattoo shop and worked with a non-binary person who taught me how to tattoo. Mm -hmm. Um, But that came much later in life, so. Patrick, do you want to hop in? Sure. Um, so I have a I have a really interesting uh, experience with art because I grew up in in two worlds. For anybody who doesn't know, I grew up in uh, Ankara, Turkey, and came to the United States when I was eighteen. Um, and but I did spend some time in my childhood here in the U.S. And Turkish art is very traditional. Um, everything that's created and everything that is taught is about teaching the classics, perpetuating um, classic Turkish. Uh, artistic style, um, you know, arts like ballet and opera, um, fine art painting, um, you know, uh, pottery work. These are all the arts that I grew up with, which um, are have basically no conversation about gender, sex, sexuality, or anything because they're they're rooted in kind of sexless, genderless figures and sexless, genderless characters and people and objects. Um, so, you know, that paired with the kind of very, very queer musical theater that I did in the summertime, I had this very odd (laughs) experience with art, um, because I literally, I mean, I remember one of the most, like, interesting moments for me artistically was when I was, I think I was in middle school, and in Turkey, you're required to take art classes and music classes and stuff like that until you get to high school. And so I think I was in middle school and I I did a, a still life and it was a painting of a vase and it had a piece of, of like straw, um, not straw, um, wheat in it. And, and I did that because I thought it would be fun to draw. And my art teacher abruptly told me, you would never put wheat in a, in a vase and that is not good art. This isn't art. Um, and it, it, it just like, you know, it was this defining moment for me about yeah. like what is art. Um, and... So I guess similar to, to Finn, when I like came to the U.S. and I came out of the closet and I started surrounding myself with queer people because I had never had queer people around me. Like even when I was younger in musical theater, like there were like queer people, but I didn't really understand because I was like young and naive and stupid. Um, and, you know, it was I, as I started to surround myself with more and more queer people, especially as I started getting more and more surrounded by drag artists and kind of people I would define as radical queer, um, my kind of whole perspective on art changed. Um, but I mean, even even then, I mean, to be honest, 90% of the representation of queer art I see and queer people in art I see is at the gallery at the Pride Center. It's not necessarily in mainstream art yeah. anywhere. Um, and when it is, it's often not being produced by queer people or being created by queer people, um, which is what brings me back to this idea of like, what is queer art all the time? Uh, we, yeah. It's- sure, yeah. As, as far as representation goes, I think I was just having the conversation with some folks about this last night, actually, that I feel like it, it came in really unconventional ways. I was an only child for the first nine years of my life. And so growing up, I was like kind of my own best friend when I wasn't like at school. Um, or, you know, like giving giving over to, to television and, and movies. And so like one thing that really, uh, one representation that really comes to mind that wasn't like so explicit, but but um, that I like have always held on to is Chris Tucker's character in The Fifth Element, mm-hmm. um, which may, might be an obscure <laughs> <laughs> reference, um, but I know that the movie is a cult classic and, and forgive me for forgetting the, char- the character's name, but this like, androgynous person he's dressed so feminine and is and is so like well loved and adored by these women and like has this swap like it's it was just this like like this this gender um f word i don't know if i can curse on this but <laughs> you can, i already did <laughs> okay this gender fuckery you know that's going on and i was obsessed um as a kid and so when I think of representation and and feeling like a connection, so um, things like that where where gender was like being played with so heavily, and I see it now as an adult. Um, but as a kid, I was just like, 
you know, like wide and like, wow, that person is like really different, but they're, they just seem like so cool. And I like, I want to be them or be with them. And like, that's, that's amazing. And so for me, it was, I think a lot of like TV and film and like these unconventional ways. And then I, you know, I came out uh, when I was 14 and started doing theater when I was 16 in high school. But even within within theater, like there were other queer people, but it was still, you know, everything's like rooted in in like whiteness and, and the classics. And and so there's a lot of gender binaries that you have to play into. Um, and then I ended up going to a private Christian university to get my my degree in theater arts. And so that also did not help as far as representation goes. Um, <laughs> uh, so it really wasn't until I graduated, you know, over four years ago. And like I had moved to San Francisco right afterwards. And I think that for me was like a huge. And I, I remember, you know, walking through the Castro one of the first times when I had first moved there and like seeing queerness so so liberated and so celebrated in this space and like blatantly out in front of you rainbows everywhere i remember like having this anxiety in me this like internalized i think homophobia that still existed from four years of christian university um even though i'd been out since i was 14 and never like went back into a closet but still like those four years kind of like instilled this this like n this anxiety in me that if i was revealing too much of myself that there was like something uh bad was going to come out of it mm -hmm. and to finally like be in the very liberated space like san francisco and then you know going like going to as many drag shows as i can and and meeting more queer people and and you know that 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 for me is when it really like started to push me more forward in this uh and seeking out like better representation. Like, I mean, and I mean, going back to like sort of these random moments, I know that um, for me, my, I think my my introduction to to like ballroom and voguing and, and Paris is Burning was through a TV show that was back, that was on back in like 2009 called uh, America's Best Dance Crew. And there was a group on there um, uh, by the name of Vogue Evolution, and they um, like were like representing that scene. And I was like, "What is this? I love them. I want this group to go all the way." Like I'm seeing like queerness and and queer people of color being represented on TV on on MTV of all places too. And these it was always these like little hints. So I think I I just like went had to go and like find things for myself for sure yeah lucy can i add one thing because it, it something dawned on me when joey was speaking absolutely not i also <laughs> want to add one thing because yeah i feel like joey brought <laughs> some voice to that <laughs> well so uh, can yeah. i just say that i think a lot of my internalized homophobia from my 20s goes back to me being involved in very binary heteronormative theater and i never really it never really thought about it but like all this idea of like needing to be straight acting so you can get the lead and like mm -hmm. forcing yourself to like squash out your queerness even though supposedly like theater and the arts is supposed to be this like radically queer and and welcoming space i just like, i don't know when you were talking that dawned on me also um equally about fifth element and his character's name was ruby rod that's it <laughs> yes thank you <laughs> impressive finn i know you wanted to hop in as well yeah, but like I, I feel like you know we're we're talking about representation and like yeah, you know, Joey's talking about like you're finding these, you're going out and seeking these things, and you're finding this. What was it? Vogue Revolution was the group. Of uh, you know Vogue, Vogue you, Evolution, yeah. Vogue Evolution, you know, like you're and you're just going out of your like. I think representation is something that like we as queer folks, like true representation, we have to like go out there and seek it. Like we have to find the communities and like, that's why community is so, so important because like all of this stuff that I know about now and all of the people that I surround myself, like I was thinking about it and like so many of my friends are like queer artists. Like I, I, I just have this reality that I built around myself because I have the privilege and access to, you know, meet meeting people and stuff like that. So like, I think it's, 
I don't know. I don't think we should have to work so hard as individuals to find things that resonate with us like that. And, um, you know, I wish there was more like true, true representation. Um, I, I, I just, I, I want to talk about this one experience that I had. Um, cause like, I think like talking about like local queer artists is like my, that's like ever since I moved to New Haven, that's like been like my special interest. Like I just love local art. And um, I saw an artist by the name of Mucha last year. I don't know if you did. I, I was trying to see if you did some kind of press on that, Lucy, but they, I don't know if you They are amazing. Yeah. So I, um, I've, I've reported on Mooncha, including when Mooncha was Moonchild. Um, ah, yeah, yeah, see, I yeah and and they, they are phenomenal. They are an amazing, yeah. amazing artist. Yes. So like... I saw them last year when they did this musical with uh, their art collective that they have called The Quest Presents. Um, and it was called NRG The Musical. And I I bought tickets to this on a whim. And it didn't seem like, you know, like I, I 2019 was the year I really started getting into like rap music and stuff and trying to like broaden my horizons and just like hip hop in general. So like I, I kept an eye on the State House because I know they do a lot of different I love the state house for having such a different array of, you know, types of music there. Um, so I bought the tickets to it and like, I immediately walked into the state house and like, I didn't really know much about Moonsha other than like what I'd listened to them on Spotify. Um, so when I walked in, I just immediately was like, I feel comfortable here. Like, I don't know what it is about it. I feel comfortable here and I'm sitting down and the performance starts and like it honestly, my mouth was agape the entire time. And I had this realization of like, Oh my God, this is queer art. Like I just knew it inherently in my bones, even though I didn't know anything about the artist, um, you know, what they identify as and things like that. But like, it just, I knew it. And I think that's like, I don't know. I just, I really wanted to talk about Moocha, honestly, because I think they're a great example of like queer art and like, yeah. Uh, I, I absolutely. Oh, please don't apologize ever, like ever, just as a, as a thing. But um, <laughs> I, yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that in this city, we are really blessed that um, we have several grassroots groups, both artistic groups and groups that I think of as more broadly creative, including Black Lives Matter New Haven, which is led by a group of five women who really live at the intersection of their blackness and their queerness. And they own it and they are just fierce and phenomenal. And we are like, we are deeply lucky um, to, to have that in, in the city. Um, yeah. It, it, yeah, New Haven is, is a better place because of that. But um, so, so I want to get to some of the questions, but also I, I want to say, you know, there's also this question of like art. And I know as a moderator, I'm not supposed to share anecdotes, but Patrick has heard this before. I remember pitching a story on drag when I was not yet at the arts paper. So there was a different editor. Um, and I remember pitching a story on drag and the editor shot it down and said, that's not art. That's not art at all. Um, and I, I was, um, I think, upset and dismayed. <laughs> Um, but, and sort of push back. And it opened this conversation that I still find myself navigating in a lot of spaces about what's art and like also is there a hard boundary? And so I would love to know from all three of you as working creatives um, what, what that looks like. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go first. Cause, uh, <laughs> cause I, I actually, um, I argued this uh, to the state a couple years ago, two years ago, um, on the stage over uh, on um, Center Street, or not Center Street, whatever, what's that street? College Street. Um, and because they had had me come in for uh, the Arts Day. And, you know, I stand by this and I always say this, like art happens everywhere in every parts of our life. And it doesn't have to be on an expensive canvas. It doesn't have to be on a main stage and it doesn't have to be like, ten thousand dollars to produce it can art is like life is art right like everything around us is art and you know um i i you know as a naturist as somebody who loves nature nature is art like everything around us is art and so to to try to like <clears throat> 
define it in in any other way is is both insulting to the concept of like creationism and art and like being being artistic. Um, but you know, I, I will say, and I do this all the time. So um, queer art and underground art in general is very underrepresented because there's this like tier of what is art. There's like the ballet, the theater, the opera, the, the you know, fancy Renaissance arts and blah, 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 that are like this higher level of art and deserve thousands and thousands and thousands and millions of, of grant dollars and thousands and thousands and thousands and millions of donor dollars and rich white people dollars and all of this other stuff. And then there's all of the other art that happens around the world. Um, and some of that happens in bars, some of that happens in tattoo shops, some of that happens in a black box theater. Sometimes that happens like with a bunch of actors or dancers on the New Haven Green, right? Like it happens all around us. Um, and unfortunately that's not worthy of thousands and thousands and millions of dollars. Um, and so I think that as um, a producer of art and a facilitator of art, um, sometimes I have to play their game and I have to talk about pride as not being um, a civil rights uh, gathering, but talk about it as an art festival. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to necessarily be like, oh, we're doing a drag show, but I'm doing, we're doing performance art um, and, and use their language to, um, and their like, systems of oppression that they've created to my advantage and take advantage of it. And I recognize as a very, very white skinned, like super passing and everything, but the fact that I'm very, very gay, um, I can get away with that in ways that other people can't. So I recognize that, and I, 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 I say that with, um, you know, uh, with that recognition. But yeah, I mean, I, I hate, I hate this question, and I, I, I feel that Lucy, because I've experienced that working at arts organizations. I've been told certain audiences are not important to bring in because they don't matter. And and I feel like this question of like, what is art is in the same place. Which I, I will say, so I want to hear from Joey and Finn, but I will say I can go like, we, we could, how many hours do people have? Because we could go <laughs> all day. Um, Joey, I'm going to hop to you. Yeah, would you mind repeating the question? Oh, um, so... I think some people put up hard boundaries to art. And, and I think that is also informed very often by white, like toxic whiteness mm -hmm. and white supremacy culture, especially in arts organizations and organizations that sort of eat up all the dollars, right? Because they know how to use this language that is, as Patrick pointed out, inherently oppressive. Um, mm -hmm. And they also know how to use a language about for the community and not with the community that some foundations and some grant making organizations are still unfortunately very responsive to. And so how do you see art? You know, do you think it has any sort of hard boundary or the boundaries more porous for you? Oh gosh, I think um, I, I hear boundaries and I also think of binaries, right? Compartmentalizing and, and, and gatekeeping and everything that we've already been sort of like, um, uh, offering here in this conversation. Um, I mean, I know RuPaul is problematic, but one thing I do like kind of like hard, hard agree on is, is when uh, he says you're born naked and the rest is drag, right? Like things that you're doing on your daily basis when you wake up in the morning, how you choose to represent yourself, you're performing something to other people when you go into work and when you go and socialize with your friends and then you're different when you're like coming home to your family, you're performing roles um, and, and gender and you know, playing into whatever you're existing in. Um, yeah, I, I think I think um, your boundaries just continue continue to place harm on people, right? Unless you're not within when you're when you're outside and exist, existing on the margins, and you're not you know fitting into this this center that continuously is is fed into mainstream culture. You're um, I think I think there are people that continue to push to check, try to be in that center, but I think other people embrace living on the margins at times, and you know what, and and that's why I think, as far as queer art is concerned, it's inherently never going to be. I don't think it ever wants to be, um, like mainstream. Um, it can, and, and it should be, it it should be highlighted and it should be represented and. And to kind of like go to the to, to maybe like reflect on the question of what are our, what are our methods of equity accountability, you know like 
being in positions that we're in where um like myself as a producer you know i know that not everything i'm going to work on is going to like feel like something that i represent that that represents me um and my and sometimes there might have to be like the crucible um <laughs> um but then there's opportunities where we have artists coming to us with ideas and we're like, yes, we're gonna run with this and we're gonna make something like black trans women at the center. And it's going to be, you know, co-led by a black trans woman. And we're gonna have all these artists come and be a part of this event and and share these lives and these experiences and, and their artistry with this audience that, um, you know, I'm still not completely familiar with because I'm still in my first year of living in the New Haven area. Um, but know that Long Wharf has a history of, uh, Long Wharf is a predominantly white institution and has a history of having predominantly white audiences attending. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful that even, you know, in the old world pre-quarantining, um, in the short time that I have been with Long Wharf, that the three shows that I was, you know, well, two shows that I was working on because I had started the day after On the Grounds closed, but those three shows, On the Grounds, Pride and Prejudice, and I Am My Own Wife had queerness in them and queer representation um, and non-binary representation. Um, and so I'm extremely grateful for that. And I think, I, and, just, and just because I am, I, I would be working on something like The Crucible or Romeo and Juliet doesn't necessarily make the art that's being produced queer just because I, a queer person, am, am working on it. But, you know, I think it's it's when you start like ideating with everybody and like bringing all these different um, ideas together and, and trying to to add a new perspective into something, that's what's when, you know, it's, it's the, the collaboration um, is really going to feed into, you know, breaking those boundaries. Yeah, I will say, I, I think Shakespeare has always had the potential and has the intention to be super queer. Um, and it is, I, I truly do believe that it's like white supremacy, heteropatriarchy bullshit that has made it not super. I mean, it, yeah, we could, we could talk about that later. But um, yeah, I think Shakespeare is, is deeply misunderstood and deeply misinterpreted by like 90% of theaters. But, but Finn, um, I want to get to you as well. Um, so I think that like I, I could definitely resonate with Joey when I think of like borders and stuff like that. I just started of thinking of like boxes and, um, you know, I think like a good representation of like that is so I actually I'm a hairstylist. Uh, that's one of my many trades, too. Um, I've been a stylist for or a license holder for about eight years now but I worked at a really terrible salon and it ended up killing that passion and drive for me. So I stopped doing hair for a while and I ended up at my current job here, which is um, I work at salons by JC and Milford. And it's um, essentially like we have 42 rooms in here and um, they are rented out by people in the beauty industry. So it's essentially like uh, an apartment for hairstylists pretty much. And uh, I'm sitting in one of my styles right now. He's Brandon, Brandon Borges, and he is a queer artist too. The cool thing about my job is that, like, we have multiple queer people here. We have many people of color here. Like, it's such a fucking diverse group of people. And I think, like, you know, Brandon as a queer artist, just to share his story a little bit, he was working at a really high end salon in Stanford, and like, you know, at the the culture there, my God, like the, the, the toxic culture in the, like a salon of just very, you know, you, you, you can picture what it'd be like, but he came here and opened his own business and like flourished. Like I, he's been here like over two years now and like the growth of him, like personally and artistically has been like incredible, you know, and like he's successful and so much happier so I think like once you start telling, like I think learning the rules is important, like how to do things in, you know, color theory, blah, blah, blah. But like, I feel like, you know, outside of like doing like racist, derogatory, you know, defamatory artwork, like I think that kind of thing, like that's my hard border where it's like, I don't think that, that there's any space for that. But outside of that, it's like, 
it's fun. It's art. It's like a place to escape. Why would you want to put confinement on that? Yeah. Well, I want to return to a question that was asked earlier, and, and I just want to make sure we have time for it. So Sulina Morales, um, who has a show, I, I should have said that, at the Pride Center, some of the works are behind Patrick, which may have mentioned, but um, writes, I don't know the answer to this, but how do we ensure that queer art, however that's defined, is getting more representation and expansive representation? What are our methods of equity accountability? Who wants to tackle that first? Patrick, do you want to hop in? Sorry, I muted myself. Um, sure, I, I can do that. Um, my answer is going to be this, which is as a community and as queer people, um, our artists are going to have equity when we support them and we, uh, whether that's buying their art, buying their books, uh, going to their drag shows, um, and stop consuming non-queer art that is impersonating as queer. Um, you know, stop uh, spending thousands and thousands of dollars on, on work by straight people that's impersonating us. Like, stop hiring as much as I love Macklemore, stop hiring Cindy Lauper, stop hiring these people to headline pride that are straight and take advantage of our community's income. They're amazing, they're awesome, they're great supporters of our community, but like, why are we paying Cindy Lauper $75,000 to headline pride? Why not play like 10 amazing queer artists, $7,000, like, right? Like that's how we start to get equity is holding people and organizations and um, in our community that make these decisions to invest that money in our community, um, who have access to those big dollars. And then as a community, make a commitment to supporting each other um, and each other's equity. And in, in, you know, like if you're gonna buy art for your house or your apartment or your room or your office, why not buy it from a queer person? Why not buy it from a local queer artist? Like I'll go the step further as a local for it. And like, you know, be reflective of what Finn's talking about. Cause I am also like, you would be like, let's support the local people. <laughs> like, um, mm -hmm. you know, like give, keep, you know, one of the things that um, uh, a student uh, who I met at Yale a number of years ago um, who came to Yale non-traditionally um, and had a really interesting kind of experience of being homeless and whatnot and then coming to New Haven um, after like very interesting life experience. Um, one of the things he said to me was is that, he was at the business school, is, is that we we as the community need to do what the Jews did after World War II, which was a lot of Jewish communities really centered about spending their money at Jewish owned businesses and, and, and keeping the money kind of quote unquote in the community. And I think one of the ways, not the only way, but one of the ways we could start to find equity for artists within our own community is doing the same thing. Is, is that as a queer person, if I'm gonna buy a piece of art for my house or I'm gonna buy a piece of art from for a space, like buy it from a queer person. If I'm, if as a queer person, I'm gonna spend some money uh, at a bar or a restaurant, like go to a restaurant that's owned by a queer person, you know, you can go anywhere, but you know, why not spend most of your money at a queer, queer restaurant or a queer bar or giving money to a drag queen instead of, you know, um, another version of Hamlet. Um, Sorry, Shakespeare. Uh, <laughs> so that's that would be how I could see a way that a path to equ more equity for our artists. Yeah, uh, Finn, I'd like to go to you next. Yeah, I think like Patrick, you said it very well. I I really feel like it's uh, on the res like the queer community as a whole. We're a marginalized group, but. Among us, I think it's the responsibility of the most privileged to make sure that our equity is going back into our people, like just like you said, Patrick, you know. Um, and because, like, I don't really trust the government to do that for us. Um, you know, I, I think that, like, and just building networks um, and, you know, like that's strengthening the people around you because I think, like, you know, that's why I focus so much on local because it feels more 
manageable to me to like help these people. And I just kind of hope that it radiates outward. And, you know, I think like when the queer community works together and like, I'm seeing more and more of it, like people actually like waking up and realizing like we have so much more work to do to like help our community out. Like, I think it's just going to get better too. And I think with like, like, I really am like rooting for our next generation of like, like our young queers. Like, I feel like they're going to be doing and are already doing. I mean, like, I, I isn't like um, Black Lives Matter New Haven, like a bunch of like younger people too. Or there's like one group in New Haven of activists that's like young kids, like citywide um, youth. Citywide youth, thank you. Um, yeah. So it's like, like these kids are kicking ass, and like, and I feel like that's like that's honestly like where I think like, and we have to continue like to be you know inspiring them and supporting them too. So, Joey. Yeah, I mean, echoing everything that Patrick and, and Finn has said, and also um, driving this point home of, of supporting those who are most vulnerable, right? Uh, the life expectancy of a Black trans woman is still only 35 years old. Um, and that, that uh, that's really, I don't know, like that, that's just a, it's a, it's a weight, right? And I feel like with marriage equality passing, you know, um, earlier in this decade, a lot of people said, you know, okay, great, we did that, and now we're we're done, um, and we we've we've got what we wanted um, from the movement, and and we can continue to just live our lives and 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 not acknowledge uh, these these other people in our community who continue to be disproport disproportionately affected by violence. Um, and discrimination and you know as i mean and 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 supporting these these people who who identify as artists is one of those ways where we continue where we can like start to shift and change the the overall narrative right and giving these people uh economic stability and and exposure showcasing their their truths and their lives and and um Give, allowing them to to use use any privilege and platform that you have to express themselves and share their story and make people realize that they are part of the community and integral to it, right? Um, and and necessary for us to continue moving forward as a society. So I think that's that's definitely something that we need to um, contribute to. Yeah. Um, so my my final question, time really flies, and my final question for everyone, uh, since we have just talked about this, is what are some super amazing queer artists or queer businesses in, in my, so my community is New Haven, I know all of your communities are New Haven and Greater New Haven, um, that if, if I'm a listener that I can go out and support. Patrick, I know that you've got an hour of suggestions, but I'm only going to give everyone about two minutes. So if you, so I'm going to, I'm going to combine the idea of giving equity to back to our artists and also take some of what Joey was talking about. And I'm going to say, if I could pick one organization right now that wasn't the New Haven Pride Center, because obviously I shouldn't pick that. Um, I would say an organization like Camorra's Cultural Corner in Hartford. Um, it is a black, queer, Afrocentric, um, community space that uses art and artists to elevate the voices of black, queer, um, Afrocentric individuals. Um, it is unapologetically queer, it's unapologetically black. Uh, it fights against racism and anti-blackness and our community in large, uh, straight, gay, you know, queer, doesn't matter, they're fighting against it all. And and they elevate the voices of a lot of really incredible artists, people like Anne Goh and First Light Poetic, um, Arian Wilkerson, you know, these incredible, um, black queer artists from Connecticut, um, Greater Hartford in Connecticut. And so I was gonna say, if you're gonna, if you're gonna not support the Pride Center or support someone and someone else, I would say Camorra's Cultural Corner in Hartford. Great. Um, Finn, I'll hop to you. I wanna give you time to, to swallow your water. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like right now I'm really 
into music. So I know I talked about Muncha earlier yesterday or earlier t- today. <laughs> Sorry, I need my my mid coffee. Um, but also uh, another artist that I want to, another local artist that released an album this year that you should absolutely throw money at is an artist named Nigel. And um, he's a queer rapper. And I saw him at State House too, actually. Um, the album that he released this year is uh, from start to finish, absolutely amazing. Um, and it openly, like he uses um, a lot of words like the F word as a, an empowering, um, you know, kind of reclamation of like a lot of queer slurs, um, you know, has songs like that or just like, about ha- supporting black trans women like it's the album of 2020 so um yeah check those artists out please <laughs> yes okay joey close this out oh my gosh i'm a little embarrassed but i'm definitely taking these recommendations from patrick and finn because <laughs> i um you know i'm just going to admit that i actually am very unfamiliar with the local artists scene um and have a lot of work to do on my part with that um my hope actually was to spend this summer being able to do that and going out and like seeking these, <laughs> these opportunities to connect with the community. Um, and unfortunately that didn't, that didn't happen. So I'm, I'm going to, going to take these recommendations and continue to scour the interwebs. Oh, and I completely forgot too. like, I need to mention uh, Brandon's palette in Milford, Connecticut and a queer hairstylist. If you're looking for, um, you know, a safe place to get your hair done where you will be respected and treated nicely. And also I manage the building and it's managed by a trans person. That's pretty cool. So that's me giving myself a little shout out. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I, I will say it's around lunchtime. So, um, I'm going to add Tayamo tequila and um, and Barracuda to that list run by Sonia Salazar, who um, who is presented for Pride Week and is an absolutely amazing human being and truly makes some of the best food and alcohol. If we, I don't know if we can mention alcohol here, of course. but also alcohol. And- <laughs> Joey and I swore, so. <laughs> um, yeah, but, um, but thank you all so, so much. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and I just love hearing all of you. My only regret is that we don't have five hours to continue this conversation. <laughs> it's a sign we have to have another one. Agreed. That's right. That's Agreed. right. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Likewise. No, Thank you. Uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap us out since I'm like the center representative. That's right. <laughs> um, but again, thank you to all our panelists. Thank you, thank you, Lucy, for. Uh, moderating. Um, thank you to our amazing ASL interpreters uh, and a shout out to Nick who's been coordinating that for all of Pride events. Um, and as you can see on the bottom of the screen right now, there is a web address to get more information. Pride New Haven does go on for the next four more days. And then we will be back in October for Pride in person. Yes, we're doing an in-person event. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to uh, Juan Carlos who took over being stage manager for this talk so that I could be on the panel. So thank you everyone. And thank you, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.